might have to have a talk with Caleb. I can't have him out dressing me on Sunday mornings. <laughs> you will turn to your Bibles this morning to the book of First Samuel. First chapter. As you're turning there, I want to give you guys a few updates on some things I mentioned to you last week for prayer request and uh, encourage you to continue to pray. Uh, my friend that I requested prayer for last Sunday that was missing was found deceased on Sunday. And uh, I ask you to pray for her family continually. The service that was yesterday, and uh, as you can imagine, they're having a challenge coping, but God is good. God is faithful in the midst of everything. That's uh, the one resounding theme that I heard in the service yesterday was that hope had made an impact for Christ in life after life after life. And that is so valuable and so important to know that your life was lived sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, also, I gave him prayer requests last Sunday from Melissa's grandfather. He passed early Thursday morning. Um, just to encourage you to please continue to pray for the Willoughby family. Um, we rest in knowing that Guy is with his Savior, but it is still very challenging. First Samuel, first chapter, beginning with verse 8. This is not an unfamiliar passage of Scripture. It's not an unfamiliar story. Um, I'm kind of starting you somewhat in the middle of it, but, and I'll try and give you some rewind throughout the message so you get the entire story. But I, I want you to pay careful attention to what you see here. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8 says, And Okna, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. And she was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life. And no razor shall touch his head. And she continued praying before the Lord. Excuse me, as she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. And Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. And then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you've made him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. And then the woman went away and ate, and her face was no longer sad. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And God, we thank you. God, we thank you that, Lord, in the midst of pain, in the midst of adversity, in the midst of anxiety, God, you hear the cry, the sincere cry of your people God, we know that, Lord, in ta challenging times, Lord, you're listening, and Lord, you want to hear our hearts. God, I pray today that these words would permeate our hearts, God, that, Lord God, it would find fertile ground, that, Lord, you would challenge us in our spirits to pray desperately for you to move in our hearts and lives. God, I pray that, Lord, today you would move us and challenge us, God, to be more like you and to be closer to you. Father, Lord, we pray that every heart would hear and receive the things that you have to say. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, folks, i got to be honest with you. I've, I've come to a sobering conclusion recently. As a nation, 
we are in big trouble. It is unmistakable. You can't turn on the news and avoid it. You can't go out in public square without hearing it. You can't go on social media without seeing it. It is clear and obvious that these are desperate times. We are on the verge of a shift in our country. And I believe that we're getting ready to see a shift one way or another. I believe we're either going to see a great falling away or we're going to see people drawn to Christ. Time will tell and hearts will determine. But one thing that I know from reading scripture is that desperate times call for desperate prayers. You know, there's, there's an old saying that desperate times call for desperate measures. Well, I believe desperate times call for desperate prayers. I believe that we as believers need to get on our face before God, not only to pray for our nation, but to pray for our own needs that we have that are burdening us. It's, it's unmistakable many times when you walk in a church, you can feel a heaviness, a burden, when the people are challenged and burdened, when their lives are overwhelming. And it's, it's easy to be there. I'll tell you, you know, I, I am not my normal self today. I'll be honest with you. I have been challenged this week, over the last couple of weeks even. But one thing I know and one thing that Hannah's prayer shows me is that God is faithful. Amen. And as I look at this, I see the beginning of what I want to preach for the next few weeks. And that is the idea that desperate times call for desperate prayers. We'll look at, over the next three weeks, some desperate times in the, the nation of Israel. The des desperate times in the lives of the children of Israel, or the, the people of Israel. And we will see within that desperate prayers and what the hallmarks of a desperate prayer are. There are some things that, it, you know, when you begin to realize them, it changes your prayer life. It changes the way you pray. It changes the urgency of how you pray. I believe that God honors best desperate prayers. Mark Batterson says, has said many times that bold prayers honor God and God honors bold prayers. I would go further to say that God honors desperate prayers. And desperate prayers honor God because we recognize in desperate prayer that God is our only hope. first message I want to focus on Hannah's desperate prayer we see as we backtrack the story a little bit the story of a family we have Elkna who's the husband Elkna has two wives one is Hannah and one is Penaniah Penaniah is a wife who has had many children for Elkna Hannah has been unable to conceive every year at the appointed time they go to sacrifice and when they go Elkna gives portions to each side of the family. Interestingly enough, we see that even though Penaniah meets the cultural norms and should be the favored wife, because she's not only able to give him children, but she's given him male children, the Bible says, if you go back prior to verse 8, that when they went to worship, that Hannah was given a double portion by Elkna for the sacrifice. You know, it's amazing. Even when we feel like our lives are incomplete, we still can see the favor of God at work in our lives. And we see Hannah is here. She goes to, to sacrifice, and it says that on the way up to sacrifice, that Penaniah begins to mock Hannah. And in fact, we're, we're, we would believe, based on re the reading of the story, that this is a common occurrence. This is not a one-off. This happens not only on a regular basis at home, but all, it seems every year on the way to sacrifice. It seems as though every single time they go, she is reminded by Penaniah that she's not able to conceive and she's mocked. And when they get to the place where they're going to eat, Hananiah, or excuse me, Hannah is moved with tears. She's grief-stricken. She doesn't even want to eat. And, and Elkna in our opening verse says, listen, you know, isn't it enough that you have me? Aren't I more valuable to you than ten children? Well, as we see the scene shift, we see that Hannah 
cannot be satisfied simply with the things that should make her happy. She needs and she wants more. And we begin to see her prayer of prayer, and it's a prayer of desperation. And the, there are three things I want to point out to you in this prayer. First of all, you'll see that desperate prayers are born out of a broken heart. You cannot pray a desperate prayer if you don't have a desperate need. You can't pray a desperate prayer without a sense of urgency in your life about that need. Secondly, we see that desperate prayers come with a cost. And for Hannah, there is no price too high to pay for God to answer. Finally, we see that desperate prayers are poured from your soul. They aren't rehearsed words. They aren't previously written. They aren't... Um, thought out even usually they just come out of your being as we begin to read the story i want to take you back and point you to these to these facts look at the very first thing i told you that desperate prayers are born out of a broken heart verse 8 he says why do you weep and why do you not eat and why is your heart sad it's obvious you know you can tell when someone's depressed right yeah, there are those hallmark signs of depression, like people don't want to eat, they're not sleeping properly. You see those things that you can obviously pick up on. And it's clear to him that her usually joyful countenance has changed. She's not the same person she was. She's overwhelmingly sad. And sometimes our brokenness comes from any number of things. It can be because, uh, like Hannah, that she's being reminded constantly that she's not lived up to expectations. It could be that it's not what we thought it was going to be. It could be that things didn't work out the way we had them planned. It could be that our dreams have not been fulfilled. Any number of things can change our countenance. But the question is, what moves you to pray? What moves you to really go to a season of prayer? You know, i got to be honest with you, my heart breaks for our country. My heart breaks for our city. I'll be honest with you, I drive through Chapel Hill sometimes, and I pass churches and I feel, I feel depressed. Because I see what is supposed to be a place for souls to be saved and the word of God to be preached and, and for the, the good news to be preached to the poor as, as Jesus uh, quoted from Isaiah in the synagogue as we see that, oh yeah, it's supposed to mend the brokenhearted to heal those uh, that are they're wounded to, to let the oppressed go free. That's what it's supposed to be about. But instead there are banners out front declaring their beliefs that are outside the word of God. I'm not even going to lie to you, it turns my stomach, as I know it does God's, for a banner to be placed out. In this church, we believe that, it might as well say that sin is okay, that you can live however you want to. That's what the sign should read. But instead, things like, you know, all genders are acceptable to God, and, and that it's, it's wholly okay in the sight of God, and, and love is love. Yes, indeed, love is love, and lust is lust. And two, the two are not the same. Sorry. I'll, I'll track for a moment. But it, it's, it's part of what breaks my heart to see the church in the shape that it's in. But we see here, verse 10 says, She was deeply distressed, and she prayed to the Lord, and she wept bitterly. You know, this is not a, now I lay me down to sleep prayer. This is not a 30-second, uh, you know, man, i got to pray for this need. Let me not forget it. Let me pray very quickly for this. This is not a, oh, this is, this is somewhat important. i got to write it down and, and put it into my prayer routine. This is an urgent need moving the heart of Hannah. If you don't have a burden for a need, you can't pray desperately for it. Because when you're moved to desperate prayer, it changes your heart. It makes you want the things that God wants. It makes you want them so much that nothing else matters. For Hannah, food does not matter. For, for Hannah, being the pleasant, jovial person that she should be does not matter. 
For Hannah, uh, being favored does not matter. Nothing else matters to Hannah but seeing God answer her petition because her heart is broken. And what we see is it's not a selfish petition. If it had been, it would have been, God, give me a son so that I can be recognized as being the woman I'm supposed to be. That wasn't the prayer. The, the prayer wasn't, hey, God, give me a son so that I can see the carrying on of my husband's family name. None of those things are in the petition. We go back and we read this, we understand why she is so desperate. You see, Elkna had two wives. The first named Penaniah. Penaniah means ruby or pearl. Translations vary. But the idea is that she's beautiful. That's the name meaning. She's beautiful. She's treasured. You can imagine how she must have felt being mocked by this, quote, beautiful woman. Clearly her beauty was on the outside, not the inside. But Penaniah is there mocking Hannah on the way to sacrifice. Reminding her of why she is not living up to her promise and what she's supposed to do. She is not only not able to conceive, she's not able to bear a son for her husband to continue the family line. She is not able to be who she's supposed to be. Interestingly enough, that should turn Elkna's heart away from her. But instead, he's drawn to her. The name Hannah means favored. You know, at the end of the day, beauty isn't what matters. You know, when it comes to living a Christian life, it's not a beauty contest. It's not about how flashy our relationship with God is. It's not about how well we pray. It's not about how well we preach. It's not about how brilliant we are when it comes to Scripture. At the end of the day, what matters is that we have a relationship with God where we are favored by God. Favor is not cars. Favor is not houses. Favor is not a large bankroll. The world has a twisted view of what favor is because of the prosperity gospel. Favor is you call upon the Lord and He hears and answers. Favor has nothing to do with money. But what we see here is that Hannah probably feels as though she is a joke. I mean, her name is favored, but does she appear to be favored? She doesn't appear favored by God, does she? She's not gotten what she's asked for, but her husband favors her. He loves her nonetheless. He says the children don't matter. What matters is that we have one another. That's the essence of what he says here. What we see is, instead of saying, this is great, I'm favored. He's given me the choice of sacrifice. It says that, she is vexed. She is having bitterness of soul, according to verse 10. The word here in Hebrew is marmara, which literally means bitter or heaviness. Her heart was heavy with her need. It weighed her down so much she couldn't eat. She didn't have any joy. She, she was only concerned with one thing, and that was seeing God move. When you pray with that kind of heart, it changes something in you. When your need is the greatest concern in your life, it changes the way you communicate with God. I'm convinced we're far too concerned with words in prayer. We're far too concerned with, with our prayers and how they sound. You don't believe me? Go to a public function. I don't care whatever function you might be able to go to. Uh, probably wouldn't happen here in Carborough, but say another city that neighbors us. Uh, you might see that if a minister is asked to pray a prayer in a public setting, you know what happens? He breaks out his sheet of paper and he reads his prayer to, to the group. Why? Because he's concerned about people looking at him and acknowledging him for his ability to put words together. Jesus says, that's what the hypocrites do. They're concerned about being heard for their many words. But it's about our hearts. And when our hearts are changed, 
God hears us and answers. When you have a broken heart, you touch the heart of God. Because as we've talked about for the last two weeks, God is moved with compassion when he sees our needs. Second thing you see is that desperate prayers come with a cost. And she vowed a vow, verse 11 says, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant, in other words, God, see my broken heart, and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. You know, we see this desperate prayer. It comes from a broken heart, and one would assume that if you're praying for something with this much intensity, that you really, really want it. And you really, really want it for yourself. But Hannah's prayer was not about her. It wasn't about achieving the thing for her to hold on to. She's so desperate for God to move in her prayer life that she says, listen, God, if you'll give me what I ask for, I won't even ask to keep it. I'll give the child back to you to serve you all the days of his life. And he's going to take that Nazarite vow. Not a, not a razor shall come upon his head. He's going to be holy and set apart from you from the beginning. He's going to be your chosen person. You know, I can't imagine praying a prayer saying, God, if you'll answer my prayer, I'll give you my child. I can't imagine. I can't imagine being willing to surrender your child. But she's so desperate for God to move, not for her own favor, not for her own reputation, not for her own abilities or recognition. She wants to be pleasing to God. The question is, when you pray a desperate prayer, are you willing to pay any price to see it happen? Are you willing to push back the plate? Fasting... And the American church is almost unheard of anymore. I tell people all the time, fast is a four-letter word. Folks don't want to hear about it. They don't want you to preach upon it. They don't, they don't want you to talk about it. It makes them uncomfortable. Sacrificing anything. The question is, when you pray, what you believe is a desperate prayer, does it go like this? God... I want you to save my lost loved one. Send somebody, anybody to them. Or God, I want you to save them. I don't care what it takes. If I have to be the one and it has to make me uncomfortable, God, send me. God, I want to see our country changed. I want to see people in our community saved. God, send somebody. That's not a desperate prayer. That's a God I'm desperate for you to use anybody else but me prayer. Hannah doesn't, that would be like Hannah praying, God, if you'll give me a child, I'll have one of Penaniah's children dedicated to you. Wouldn't have been very sincere, would it? But how often we pray that way. God, I'm willing to do whatever except this. God, you can have any part of my life except this area. This is off limits. This is mine. Now, we would never literally pray that. But in the way we pray, we often say it without words. Finally, desperate prayers are poured from your soul. I told you earlier that when we pray, we worry too much about our words. Hannah is here praying before God, and it says that she's praying from her heart. Her lips are moving, but there are no words. She's not praying out loud, and she's not concerned about what other people think of her for not praying out loud. You know, there has to have been a part that, that would naturally feel that you're going to look stupid doing this. But it's nowhere on Hannah's priority list. Nowhere is she concerned about looking stupid or foolish. And in fact, when she's confronted with a, hey, you look like a drunk lady, her response is, oh no, I'm not drunk. These prayers are coming from the depths of my soul. They're coming from my heart. Now don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that all desperate prayer is silent prayer because that's not necessarily the case. 
In fact, oftentimes we pray out loud because it makes it feel more real to us. You know we don't pray out loud so God can hear us, right? He knows the depths of our heart. He knows every thought we think. We don't have to pray out loud for God to hear us. It's not about how loud we pray. You know, one of the main reasons we pray out loud is because it makes it feel like a real conversation for us. Could you imagine going to your loved one and having a conversation with them from your heart? You know, if, if after service, Steve and Terry went home and they just looked at each other, and that was the communication, that was their conversation, that, that would be extremely challenging, wouldn't it? I promise you, you probably would not know what Steve was thinking. So few do. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It, it would be a physical impossibility. But in our conversation with God, it's not based on our words. It's not based on our volume. I've met people that think that they get heard if they pray louder than everybody else. Now, they never vocalize that, but you, you can tell, seemingly, that they want, to out, they want to outdo everybody else in the room. Well, listen, God can hear you over everybody else just fine. He doesn't need you to up the volume. But what we see here is that out of a broken heart, out of a sorrowful spirit, Hannah is crying out before God, even without words being vocalized. Out of a broken heart, out of her very soul, She's crying out to God. Now, you know, Scripture doesn't record the words of her prayer, except, God, if you'll give me a son, I'll give him back to you. Now, i got to imagine the prayer was longer than that. I don't know. I mean, God would have been able to move based on that prayer alone. Don't get me wrong. He doesn't require a lengthy prayer. But typically, when our hearts are broken and grieved, we're going to pray longer than a few sentences. And there's no recording of anything else that's said. All we know is the gist of the prayer. We know that that's what she's praying about. Nowhere are we given instructions on to how to pray. Nowhere are we told, these are the words you pray when you're praying from your soul. It just comes out. Communication that flows between you and God. And what I love about communication with God is you can literally tell Him anything. I used to, I don't want to say get on, that's the wrong phrasing, but I used to have conversations with families in hospice who would say, now I know we're not supposed to question God. Said, Where'd you hear that? Well, we're, I, I know I've been raised, we're not supposed to question God. So that's not what the Bible says. You didn't read the book of Job if you thought we weren't supposed to question God. I mean, good gracious, it's half a book of questioning God. Our attitude does matter when we do it. But God wants to hear our heart. And if truly we are considering ourselves as Abraham a friend of God, we can talk to our friend and question them. I don't understand why you've done this. i got to imagine probably for Hannah, there's some measure of God, I don't understand this. Because it's being poured out from her soul. I'm sure she's expressing doubts, fears, frustrations, every emotion under the sun you can think of that would come with being barren and being mocked for it continually. But out of the depths of her soul, she pours out her prayer. Folks, I, I'm here to tell you that when you are truly praying desperate prayers, it's going to come out of the very depths of your soul. It's not going to be rehearsed words. It's not going to be a written down prayer. It's not going to be something someone else prayed that you heard that you liked. It's not even going to come from a message you heard. It's going to come from your very soul. God, this is what's urgent and on my heart. And what we see is when Hannah prays that prayer, the heart of God is moved. She goes home and she conceives a son. And boy, does God give her a special one. She goes home and conceives a son and then she has him dedicated to the Lord. She gives him back to God. He begins working in the temple. This young man, Samuel, maybe you figured out the book is named after him. In fact, two books are named after him. 
He goes out and serves the Lord. God uses this boy who is born out of a desperate prayer. God uses this young man to be the one who anoints Saul, king of Israel, who confronts Saul when he backslides on the Lord, when he walks away from his relationship with God and decides, I can do this all by myself. And then he's used by God again to anoint the little shepherd boy, David, king over all Israel. Man, what an incredible result of a desperate prayer. So my question is, are you in a desperate time? If you are, it's time for a desperate prayer. It's time to really be moved by the heart of God and touch his heart with your heart. Pour out your soul to him. Come broken, weary. He wants to hear it. He loves you. He cares for you. You can just pour it out. And sometimes you may not even get any words out. You may just cry. And that's okay with him. He knows what you're thinking. He understands your heart. And he loves you so much more than words can say. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I come before you today. And God, I thank you that you know us, you love us, you care for us. And God, you are moved by our hearts. God, you see our broken spirits and souls. And God, Lord, it touches your heart. You're moved with compassion for us. And I thank you. God, I thank you. It's not in a multitude of words. It's not in the quality of our words. But God, it's in our ability to pour our souls before you to to out of a broken spirit share our hearts with you that you are moved. God, I pray that you would move our hearts to desperate prayer. That in the midst of desperate times, you would be moved by our hearts and our desperate prayers. God, let us pray, Lord, even as Hannah, God, that we're willing to make whatever sacrifice, willing to do whatever it takes to see you move and answer. God, move on behalf of our nation, we pray. God, we pray that we would, Lord, indeed live out your word. And Lord, we would be humbled before you and pray and ask you to heal our land. God, I pray that you would touch the hearts of our leaders. God, that they would come to you and, and surrender their lives to you and lead us, God, with your direction. Father, we ask you to move mightily. God, I pray for conviction for the churches. God, that have surrendered to the world's philosophies rather than following your word. God, may you prick their hearts and convict them before it's too late. For, Father, your word is clear. God, James says it so plainly. God, that we should know that leaders are going to be judged more harshly than the rest, especially those that lead folks astray. God, I pray that you would touch their hearts today. God, I pray that you would be with us today. Go with us from this place. God, touch our hearts this week and help us to, Lord, have the prayer life that you desire for us to have. Father, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. I want to thank you for coming today. I know there are lots of other places you could be, but you've chosen to be here. And you could have watched online, but you're here in person, and thank you for that. For those that are watching online, thank you. God bless you. Um, doesn't devalue watching online. Um, so a couple of things I want to make you aware of. Number one, offering plates are at the back uh, for you to give.